in Westlaco. Uh, my name is Brian Smith. I'm a teacher here at South Texas College. Uh, Willen and Westlaco is an annual Shakespeare Community Festival here in Westlaco, Texas. This, of course, is our college's academic involvement in the Rio Grande Valley's first and only Shakespeare Festival. Uh, every year, Willen and Westlaco focuses on one Shakespeare play. Uh, in these very troubled times, uh, a man for all times, Shakespeare is indeed welcome. This year, we're pleased to be helped uh, by a hopeful romantic comedy. We're delighted to be reveling in Much Ado About Nothing. To help us further appreciate this delightful but surprisingly puzzling comedy is none other than Professor Paul Cantor. Paul Cantor is a professor of English at the University of Virginia. He is, of course, the famous American literary media and culture critic. He's taught at the world's leading universities, published widely on popular culture, economics, art, music. But tonight, we're especially pleased to hear him speak on one of his specialties, Shakespeare. Professor Cantor is a world-renowned Shakespeare scholar. His wonderful book on Hamlet shows the tension in the Renaissance soul. It shows the tension between one who is torn between Christian and pagan notions of heroism. Professor Cantor opens timeless human questions by carefully listening to Shakespeare on the particulars of politics and culture. In his excellent work on Shakespeare's Rome and Shakespeare's Roman trilogy, Professor Cantor again focuses on important and timeless questions about politics and human nature. Professor Cantor explores Rome as both the great republic all the way through to its empire. By helping us learn about the unique aspects of Rome and Romans, Professor Cantor invites us back to Shakespeare's uh, dramatic poetry to enter into, into a fundamentally different world, but also uh, to a world that we can recognize. Professor Cantor's anal analysis helps us clarify important cultural questions, but also invites us to consider universal truths about human nature. What Professor Cantor does so well is that he takes seriously the particulars of Shakespeare's plays. Professor Cantor shows us that culture matters by showing us what, we, what can be learned from studying and listening to Shakespeare. Professor Cantor's books are available here in the South Texas College Library, but you can also find his lectures online on YouTube or collected under the Great Thinkers uh, website. You can Google Shakespeare and politics. Alternatively, you can go to uh, Professor Cantor's uh, very slick website, uh, Paul Cantor, that's one word, uh, paulcantor.io. Uh, one could say much more, uh, but more ado would distract us from the pleasure of listening to our prestigious speaker tonight. So with no, uh, no, uh, with uh, no more, uh, with nothing uh, more about our honored guest, uh, please join me in giving Professor Cantor a warm virtual welcome. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thanks for this invitation. I wish I could be uh, with you guys in person, but we'll have to do it by Zoom as things go these uh, days. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about much Ado About Nothing. Uh, it's a play I don't often get to lecture about, but I have a lot of thoughts about it. My aim tonight is to create a context for you both to understand the play and, and enjoy it. Uh, one of the contexts I'm gonna look at is literary history and to show how Much Ado About Nothing uh, features in the history of views of love in literature. And I also very much wanna talk about it as a comedy talk about in terms of genre uh, and see what is peculiar to the play because it is a comedy. Now, I think uh, Much Ado About Nothing was a great choice for your festival, and I'm so glad uh, you've done it. I will confess it's not Shakespeare's greatest play. I hope they're not trying to advertise it as such to you. It's no King Lear, uh, but it really shows something about Shakespeare that even one of his lesser plays is a great play uh, and very much seen. It's been a very popular play over the years. In particular, the characters of Beatrice and Benedict have fascinated audiences and actors and actresses love to play these roles. Uh, 
Uh, there are several good movies of the uh, play, which I gather have been available to you. I particularly recommend uh, the BBC version, which I think is excellent. The movie that Kenneth Branagh does uh, has some problems, but he's terrific as Benedict, and Emma Thompson is just wonderful uh, as uh, Beatrice. And you have no less than Michael Keaton as Dogberry in that film, and it's really quite good. I will say very little about Keanu Reeves as Don John in that movie. It's perhaps it's one uh, lesser uh, light in it, uh, but we're here to talk about Shakespeare and much ado about nothing. Uh, and I want you to begin by thinking how cheeky that title is. Shakespeare is showing off. He's saying, I'm so great, I can write a play about nothing, and you're going to love it. Uh, and indeed, it's kind of the Seinfeld of the Renaissance. This is the play about nothing, just as Seinfeld was the show uh, about uh, nothing. Uh, but the title really is very pregnant and meaningful. Uh, I'm going to argue that Much Ado About Nothing is the formula for Shakespearean comedy. That Shakespearean comedy is written in the spirit of debunking. Shakespeare likes to take something that people take very seriously, in this case, love, uh, and show you that it's really Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, and that's an incredible claim, especially from a playwright. Uh, after all, so much of literature is about love, and especially so much of drama, and including Shakespeare's own work. His tragedies are often centered around love, obviously Romeo and Juliet, but also let's take Anthony and Cleopatra. And in general, we human beings take love so seriously. And now Shakespeare comes along and tells us, it's just much ado about nothing. Indeed, I'm going to argue that the message of this play and Shakespeare's comedies in general is that we take love too seriously. Uh, we get all worked up over it. Uh, we develop a sweat <laughs> over love. Uh, uh, now, what's the problem with that? Uh, because as Shakespeare shows, too often love is something to die for. Uh, now, this play is a comedy, uh, but Hero appears to die for love in the play. And this is, according to Shakespeare, what happens when we get all bent out of shape over love. Uh, uh, Hero's own father prays for her to die. Uh, Shakespeare suggests that there's something wrong here. Uh, this shouldn't be happening. And he wants to ask, why does it happen? Uh, love has somehow gotten out of hand uh, and we need to get love back under control. We have to dial down our emotions. Love, as wonderful as it may be, is not worth people dying over. Now, Shakespeare had already written Romeo and Juliet uh, when he wrote this play. And with that play, he gave us a warning that love leads to tragedy. Uh, uh, and it's Shakespeare's discovery, especially Romeo and Juliet, uh, that love is a self-destructive passion. And indeed, as he shows in Romeo and Juliet, lovers all too often become suicidal. And why? I think that Shakespeare shows in Romeo and Juliet that lovers are obsessed with proving something, proving something about their love. And to prove their love, they must be willing to die for their love. They need to prove the strength of their love. And unfortunately, they come to feel that's the only way of doing it. And you can notice in Romeo and Juliet, anything goes wrong in their lives and, oh, I got to die. Give me a poison. Uh, Someone wrong, I got to die. And indeed, Shakespeare brilliantly contrives the plot uh, so that uh, uh, both Romeo and Juliet get to die for each other. They actually, each one commits suicide thinking the other one is dead. And this kind of love is too volatile and it's too destructive. Uh, and look what happens in Much Ado About Nothing, even though it's a comedy. It's a comedy that threatens to become a tragedy. 
I think the BBC film and the Branagh film do a very good job of showing how close this play comes to tragedy. This violence that erupts uh, over love, uh, have in mind a moment like Claudio's condemnation of Hero at their wedding. It's a horrible moment, and I'll, I'll be discussing it in a little while. Uh, and Shakespeare has a sense uh, that maybe we're staking too much on love uh, uh, if someone like Claudio could end up wanting the woman he loves dead. Uh, and Shakespeare re really has to rescue his own play for comedy. Now, this is uh, a really interesting area for Shakespeare. He wrote so many uh, comedies about love. And I think it's an area uh, uh, where Shakespeare realized, I can actually accomplish something here. I can change something in the world and change attitudes towards love. Uh, because after all, where do lovers, and especially young lovers, get their idea of love? From plays, from watching plays, uh, or we might say in general from literature. Today we would say, where do young lovers get their idea of love? From watching movies and television. Uh, uh, and movies become models for youngsters. Uh, they see how people in love behave. Uh, uh, so love is one of the prime areas where life imitates art. Uh, you know, we always speak of art imitating life, but sometimes life imitates art and love is a prime case of that. And that's the problem. This literature often offers an unrealistic view of life and especially of love. Too idealistic a view. Uh, love seems so perfect up there on the movie screen. And that becomes a problem if that's what you start expecting in real life. In a way, literature, broadly speaking, creates expectations about love that are too high. Therefore, love as you encounter it in real life can become disappointing. A man kisses the woman he loves, but there are no violins playing. What, what happened to the score with those beautiful violins reinforcing my emotions? Uh, I think Shakespeare realized that he'd been contributing to this very problem. Uh, he wrote Romeo and Juliet. I think he wanted it to be a warning. After all, it's a tragedy. Things don't work out so great for Romeo and Juliet. But when teenagers see it, to this day, they want to be Romeo and Juliet because they seem the hero and the heroine of the play. Uh, uh, and I think with Shakespeare's insight here, I'd better write some comedies about love. Uh, and he indeed went on to write a lot of them. Tragedy glorifies love. Even as tragedy shows that love is dangerous, it makes it awfully attractive, especially to over-emotional young people. What comedy does is it makes fun of love uh, and especially exaggerated views of love. Uh, uh, it makes love look ridiculous. Uh, and indeed there's sometimes nothing funnier than the really, really stupid things that people in love will do. What fools these mortals be? Uh, as Shakespeare has Puck say in A Midsummer Night's Dream about young lovers, uh, comedy knocks love off its high pedestal and knocks it down a peg or two and therefore restores a balance that I think Shakespeare thought was lacking in the love literature of his day. If you want to know what Shakespeare's doing in Much Ado About Nothing and his romantic comedies in general, think Cervantes and Don Quixote. Cervantes was a near contemporary of Shakespeare's. They actually died on the same date in 1616. Uh, Don Quixote has got a guy who goes crazy reading medieval romances, chivalric romances, the love stories of the Middle Ages. Uh, Cervantes shows Don Quixote gets his idea of love from books. And so Don Quixote idealizes uh, his beloved Dulcinea. She is the perfect woman. Cervantes debunks that. 
he shows that Dulcinea is just a peasant. Uh, the irony is that today we think of Don Quixote as a great love story. Uh, it's turned into Man from La Mancha, a Broadway musical. I think Cervantes would be appalled at this, especially if he wasn't getting royalties. Uh, but in fact, Don Quixote uh, is anti-romance. It's anti-romantic. By the way, Shakespeare knew Don Quixote. Uh, we know of a lost play of Shakespeare's called Cardinio, which would have been based on an episode in Don Quixote. So he may have actually learned a lot of this from Cervantes, although it seems he was writing his romantic comedies before Don Quixote. Uh, so what I'd like to suggest is Shakespeare is counteracting a literary view of love. And it was the one widely prevalent throughout Europe in his day. Uh, it's a medieval idea of love. We often call it the idea of courtly love uh, or the idea of chivalry. And indeed, this idea of love is developed in stories of knights in shining armor. It's developed specifically in the tales of King Arthur, which grew out of uh, uh, 12th century France. Uh, uh, the most famous example of this kind of love would be Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere. Uh, I'll talk about that in some detail in a while. This kind of uh, portrayal of love involves a tremendous spiritualization of love. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, poets began to use the language of religion uh, applied to love and applied to the love between a man and a woman. So that we talk of a knight worshiping his lady or the knight and the lady achieve heaven and love. Just to give you some examples, just within Much Ado About Nothing to show you that Shakespeare uh, has in this mind uh, uh, in uh, uh, Act One, Scene One, uh, Don Pedro accuses uh, uh, Benedict, thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty. Uh, he's talking about a heretic in a matter of love as if it's a matter of religious belief. This comes up several times uh, in the play. Another example will be in Act Two, uh, Scene Three, when Benedict says, may I be so converted and see with his eyes. Uh, and Shakespeare often uses the, uh, the language of uh, conversion uh, with regard to love. Again, as if it was converting from one religion to another. There's another example of that uh, now in Act Four, Scene One, where Hero says, uh, what kind of catechizing call you this? Talking about catechism in the matter of love. <clears throat> the Middle Ages had produced a new kind of religion of love. And Shakespeare, I have to say, was a heretic uh, uh, in it, and, and trying to uh, uh, reform it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, now, we've become so used to this literary view of love uh, that it's hard for us to understand uh, that it's not universal. <clears throat> in fact, it's very much a European tradition. You don't find it in the ancient world. You don't find it in most cultures around the world. Uh, 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 generally speaking, this is no joke. Uh, uh, especially in the ancient world, love is viewed as a matter of sexual attraction, uh, often a kind of obsession. Even as a kind of illness, the Roman poet Ovid uh, wrote a work called Remedies of Love. And it's kind of like a medical treatise. Uh, and indeed we find uh, in the love handbooks of the ancient world that they are like more like medical treatises they treat love as if it's an illness, not as if it's a great religious experience. Uh, we can see this in Homer's Iliad. Most of us, when we come to the Iliad, are really surprised that there's so little of Helen of Troy in Homer's Iliad. We think this is a great love story. It's the story of Paris and Helen. And there's almost nothing of that in Homer's Iliad. In fact, Troy as a love story is a product of the European Middle Ages, uh, of medieval reinterpretations of the story, uh, and therefore a product of a Christian civilization looking back on the ancient Greek world and reinterpreting it. Uh, uh, 
uh, again, the ancient Greeks were pagans. Uh, and that means they took sex in their stride. Uh, it was a normal part of life for them. And no big deal. Nothing to die over. Uh, uh, whereas the medieval Christians very much wanted to spiritualize sex uh, into what was called courtly love. Uh, and indeed, faith and faithfulness become much more important in a Christian world. Uh, and indeed, in many of Shakespeare's plays, we've just seen it, uh, uh, love is often compared to a kind of religious faith. Uh, and it's uh, uh, getting worn by something on my computer that I better get out of. All right. Uh, it was going to go update itself and ruin everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so fidelity and love uh, becomes a much more serious ma matter in the medieval Christian world. Uh, infidelity had been the subject of comedy in the ancient world. Uh, indeed, uh, it's the great subject of comedy among the ancient Greeks and Romans. Uh, but for Shakespeare, infidelity becomes the subject of tragedy in the modern Christian world. And a great example of that is Shakespeare's Othello. Uh, Othello would have been a comedy in the ancient world, uh, a whole play based on jealousy. Uh, and indeed, it's Othello's great fear that he's in a comedy, that he would become a laughing stock in Venice. It's why he feels a need to kill Desdemona, uh, to make sure he's in a tragedy, and it will not be a laughing matter. Uh, now Shakespeare recognized this is a genuine achievement of the Middle Ages, uh, its great idea of chivalry and courtly love. This gave a new refinement and a higher spirituality to love and elevated love above the mere animal level of sex or lust. Uh, and of course, it produced all that beautiful poetry of love, uh, much of which Shakespeare contributed to himself. But it also placed new demands upon love, it introduced absolute demands on love. Uh, uh, and I think Shakespeare worried uh, that uh, love was being made too spiritual, uh, that people were losing touch with the natural element in love, its physical element. Uh, 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 so again, it's surprising to us because we're so steeped in this tradition that love as spirituality is not a universal idea. Again, you do not find it uh, in many other cultures. Where you do, it's always cultures that have been influenced by European culture. Uh, uh, in fact, and again, this is a big surprise for most people, you can date and locate this new idea. Uh, the idea of spirituality and love uh, originates in a specific time and place. It's in the 12th century, and it's in the south of France, uh, the region we, we call Provence. Uh, and this new idea originates uh, in the small courts. Again, there's no France at this point. There's all sorts of petty kingdoms and dukedoms. Uh, 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 and appropriately, this is called courtly love. Troubadours, they are the origin of this idea of courtly love. The court singers and poets of Southern France. And again, we know them collectively as the troubadours. Now in this view, love is always suffering. Uh, uh, a knight falls in love with an unattainable lady. Uh, he worships her from afar. Uh, and this love will not be consummated. Uh, uh, there's very seldom sexual fulfillment in these love stories. Uh, moreover, it's almost always an adulterous situation uh, that makes it tragic. Uh, the knight falls in love with his king's queen. That's the story of Lancelot and Guinevere, one of the founding stories of this kind of love. It's the story of Tristan in Isolde, uh, if you know the German equivalent of this material. Uh, 
Uh, when you look at medieval love treatises, they often pose the question, is true love compatible with marriage? And the answer is a resounding no. Uh, uh, and that's why become, love becomes suffering because it's blocked. You fall in love with a woman you can't marry because she's your uh, king's wife. Uh, uh, and often this leads to a tragic outcome. That's why the Lancelot and Guinevere story is so tragic and indeed leads directly to the destruction of the round table. Uh, the story of Tristan and Isolde uh, is tragic. Later Wagner turned it into a great tragic opera. Uh, uh, and I wanna stress that this is a very radical kind of love because it's incompatible with ordinary social uh, obligations. Uh, and let me add, no marriage, no children, uh, no families. Essentially, this notion of love is that it's inc incompatible with the family. And therefore, love cannot fulfill its natural function. In Act 2, Scene 3, Bennett says, the world must be peopled. And I want to suggest that that's the deepest premise of Shakespeare's comedy. Uh, that uh, there's a connection between love and generation. And if you strictly followed the principles of courtly love, there would be no population left within one generation or non-generation, as it turns out to be. Uh, uh, so Shakespeare recognizes, and I think this is his profound insight, uh, that false ideas are circulating about love that they come from poets and they're defeating the very social purpose of love. They are demanding too much spiritualization of love and ignoring the fact that when all is said and done, love has a natural function in society. What's even worse is then a reaction sets in to this overly spiritualized medieval notion of love. It's overly idealistic and therefore breeds cynicism. People find they can't uphold uh, these artificially high uh, spiritual conceptions of love. And so they go to the opposite extreme, that love is nothing but sex. Uh, and there's no spiritual side to love. Uh, and men in particular start to make fun of these spiritual demands on love and reduce it just to sex. This is something Shakespeare shows happening in Romeo and Juliet where uh, Romeo's idealistic worship first of Rosalind uh, and then of Juliet really annoys his male friends, particularly Mercutio, and they start making fun of him and telling dirty jokes uh, left and right and reducing uh, love to sex. Uh, now, I believe that Shakespeare saw this as the issue in the poetry of his day, that the Renaissance had inherited this medieval tradition of love. You see it above all in Dante, writing in the 14th century. Uh, he really represents the high point in the medieval spiritualization of love. You can see it in his lyric poetry, especially a series of poems, La Vita Nuova, The New Life, he gave new life and spirituality to love. And of course, it's at the center of his divine comedy in the figure of Beatrice. And I don't think it's any accident that there's a Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, moreover, that she's peer, paired with a Benedict, uh, St. Benedict, the founder of the monastic order in the Middle Ages. I think these two names point to precisely the issue that Shakespeare's concerned about. Uh, 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 that, uh, We'll see in Beatrice of Benedict's case that they're the product of this Christianized understanding of love in the Middle Ages, uh, and they're reacting against it, as we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, Shakespeare's contemporaries uh, inherited this spiritualized view of love from Dante, and also from another Italian poet, uh, from Francesca Petrarca, uh, the great Petrarch, as the English knew him. Uh, his Beatrice was named Lara. Uh, and we see the same conventions in love uh, in Petrarch as in Dante. Uh, 
above all, the notion of love at first sight. Dante, Dante's first glimpse of Beatrice, she was either eight or nine years old at the time. Uh, Petrarch's first uh, glimpse uh, of Laura. Uh, and Shakespeare saw this as an absolutely absurd idea. Shouldn't you get to know the woman you love before you get so involved with her and before you die for her? Maybe just learn something about her and don't just go by first impression. Uh, uh, and uh, it's what Shakespeare ridicules in this understanding of love, the idea of loving a woman from afar. Uh, the woman becomes almost a celestial being in this kind of poetry, she's imaged in terms of stars. Uh, uh, in Sir Philip Sidney's love poetry, uh, it was him, Astrophel, and his mistress Stella, uh, the star. Uh, uh, now, Petrarch is very important to this business because he was the one who started writing sonnets uh, uh, and established the sonnet uh, as having love for its theme. Uh, uh, at one point, Mercutio was fed up with Romeo and he says, now he is for the numbers that Petrarch floated. Petrarch actually gets mentioned uh, in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I'm guessing anachronistically even uh, uh, because uh, Mercutio has heard this love poetry before. Now, there was a great sonnet vogue uh, in England in the 16th century, which Shakespeare eventually uh, participated in, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and I'll just drop some names here of the great sonnet writers, Thomas Wyatt, Philip Sidney, Edmund Spencer. Uh, uh, all of these poets embody the ideals of courtly love. Although Spencer shocked everybody, he wrote love sonnets to his wife. <laughs> Whoa, yeah, you know, how can you dare do that? Uh, but he was determined uh, 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 to show that love and marriage were compatible. Uh, uh, and these sonnets have the stock situation I've been describing. The poet worships a distant mistress. Uh, he's hopelessly in love. She won't even return his sonnets. Uh, uh, she won't talk to him. She ignores him. And so there's a tremendous amount of suffering in his poems. Uh, now, Shakespeare really scorns this in his sonnets. And I'm going to read to you Shakespeare's sonnet uh, 130, because if you can understand this, I think you really can understand the romantic uh, comedies, because it is written against the Petrarchan sonnet tradition. Did Shakespeare create his own son sonnet form to depart from Petrarch sonnet form? Uh, and what this poem was written against the kind of love poetry Shakespeare's contemporaries were writing. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, when then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damask, red and white, but no such roses see I her in her cheeks. You know, he's sick of these poets saying to the woman they love, your cheeks uh, are like roses, uh, your lips are like coral, uh, your breasts are as white as snow. Shakespeare's just fed up with this. It's just become a standard line in poetry. Uh, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet when I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. Again, all these moments when poets talk about how uh, the voice of their mistress is more beautiful than a consort of vials, whatever. Uh, and then the great lines, uh, I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress when she walks treads on the ground. And yet by heaven, I think my love is rare as any she belied with false compare. The poetic tradition lies according to Shakespeare here. And my mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. My mistress isn't a star. She's not an angel. She's down to earth. And actually, you see there the movement of Shakespeare's comedies getting us back down to earth. 
uh, uh, and Shakespeare rejects uh, these conventional women of the sonnets. He wants a real woman. Uh, uh, the typical woman of the sonnet tradition is unavailable. Uh, for Shakespeare, one of the advantages of a, of a woman, one of her good points is that she is available. Now, I don't mean that in the sense of sexual looseness, but it is, don't go pursue a woman who's already married to your prince. Or don't go pers pursue someone who's unobtainable. Uh, uh, maybe the girl next door who already loves you is the proper object uh, of your love. And above this image that his mistress is on this earth. Uh, uh, Shakespeare understands the advantages of a real live woman, uh, not the idealized image of the Petrarchan tradition. And again, I think if you can understand Sonnet 130, you can understand Shakespeare's comedies. Okay, let me turn now finally to Much Ado About Nothing, uh, which I think is a wonderful example of what Shakespeare does in his romantic comedies. Uh, uh, Above all, he wants to show that lovers create their own problems in love. Because if that's so, then lovers can solve their problems and achieve a comic ending. Uh, and indeed, uh, what Shakespeare shows is these lovers need to be shaken uh, out of their bad ideas of love and their bad habits. Uh, now, Shakespeare is writing in the tradition of what's called new comedy, it goes back to the ancient Greeks and the playwright Menander. Uh, it's picked up by uh, the Roman poets, uh, uh, Plautus and Terence. And the typical situation in so-called new comedy uh, uh, is one where young lovers face obstacles to their love. And it's chiefly parental opposition, and especially the father. The young lovers want to get married, but the father opposes it. And so the young lovers have to scheme to get together and out with their father, uh, often with the help of a wily slave. Now you can actually recognize this pattern in Romeo and Juliet, which looks as if it's going to be a comedy until it takes a tragic turn in act three. Uh, but you also can see the pattern in Shakespeare's comedies uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, uh, uh, the father opposes uh, the young lovers, even the Prince Theseus opposes them. In The Merchant of Venice, for example, Shylock and Portia's dead father uh, stand in the way of the young lovers, uh, 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 Portia and Bassanio, uh, getting together. I mean, it's a perfect example. I mean, Portia's father's even dead and is prohibiting her freedom uh, in her choice uh, in love. Uh, uh, and uh, in Merchant of Venice, uh, the opposition is rooted in some very serious real issues in the real political situation. Uh, in Romeo and Juliet, there's this family feud going on. Uh, in uh, Merchant of Venice, the religious differences between Christian and Jew uh, complicate things for the young uh, lovers. So Shakespeare tries an experiment in his comedies. Let's remove all the real opposition and see what happens. Will things work out happily for the young lovers? Uh, uh, Shakespeare comedies are often said in a utopian world. Uh, he abstracts from all the difficult political circumstances in the real world. For example, Merchant of Venice is set in Venice, uh, and that's a real world with real problems. And in Merchant of Venice, it almost produces tragedy. Indeed, Shakespeare really has to work to bring a comic ending to that play. He has to remove the play from Venice in order to have a comic resolution. He takes the play to this imaginary land of Belmont, where the opposition to the young lovers disappears. Uh, money is a real problem in Venice, we've seen, but it's not in Belmont. In Belmont, you get all the ducats you could ever want. Uh, uh, so in general, Shakespeare and comedy abstracts from political circumstances to make the comedy possible. 
uh, for Shakespeare, the political world is genuinely tragic. Uh, uh, why it's often hard to pin down the political setting in his comedies because he's trying to leave the political world behind. Uh, so in his comedies, Shakespeare generally removes the real world problems uh, that work against the young lovers achieving their happiness. It's a kind of thought experiment. Shakespeare is saying, take away the real obstacles that interfere with the young lovers and they will still be unhappy. In the absence of real obstacles, they will create obstacles. This is Shakespeare's great insight into love, especially young love. He formulates it in Midsummer Night's Dream. The course of true love never did run smooth. Why? Because that's the way the lovers want it. That's the perversity of the poetic love tradition Shakespeare inherited. The sense that it's not really love if you're not suffering. Love is conceived as martyrdom. And that's another indication that we're talking about a form of view, uh, love as viewed in a Christian uh, civil, civilization. Uh, uh, these young lovers want to prove the strength of their love by their having to undergo suffering to pursue their love. They don't want love to be smooth. That's too easy. These lovers deliberately make things difficult for themselves. Uh, uh, you don't have to make sacrifices for your love if it's all that easy. You can't prove anything about your love. Uh, in the original story of uh, Sir Lancelot, which is told by the French poet Cretin de Troyes uh, in the 12th century, uh, Guinevere says to Lancelot, at the tournament tomorrow, if you really love me, you'll lose. It's the first thrown tournament in, in world literature. And poor Lancelot takes an awful beating at that tournament to prove his love for Guinevere. By the way, Cervantes really parodies this, parodies this in Don Quixote, uh, where poor Quixote keeps taking a beating for Dulcinea. Uh, so in Shakespeare's comedies, uh, the lovers keep inventing problems for themselves so that the love is difficult. Uh, uh, in Much Ado About Nothing, Claudio is too prone to believe the lies about Hero because part of him perversely wants them to be true so that his love will become tragic. Uh, uh, Beatrice and Benedict uh, really do love each other. Uh, but they act as if they hated each other just to make their love difficult. Uh, this is what Shakespeare studies in his comedies, the way lovers create problems when there are not. Uh, uh, nobody opposes the marriage of Claudio and Hero. Her father endorses it. His prince has facilitated it. Uh, it's the very opposite of a tragic situation. So damn it, if Claudio doesn't allow the story to be turned in a, in a tragic dimension by Don John's plot against him. Uh, Beatrice and Benedict are made for each other. They're from the same social class. No one opposes their marriage. In fact, everybody is rooting for it and trying to bring it along. Uh, so this is the great theme of Shakespeare's romantic comedies, the perverse imagination of young lovers. When there are no real obstacles to their love, their imaginations will create obstacles uh, uh, just so that the course of true love uh, won't run smooth, which is what they fear. Uh, so let me try to quickly uh, talk about uh, 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 much about nothing in some detail. Uh, uh, and let me start with the, uh, uh, the problem with the lovers here. Uh, that they've inherited from love literature is they're looking for the perfect partner in love. And in that sense, demanding too much of it. Uh, look at Beatrice uh, 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 when she's confronted uh, uh, with some men, she says in act two, scene one, he were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him, Don John and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing, and the other too like my lady's eldest son, ever more tattling. Uh, 
She wants the perfect man, the happy medium, the man who combines the best of Benedict and Don John. That's asking for too much uh, in love. Uh, and you see it uh, uh, later even more clearly uh, when Leonardo says, well, niece, I hope to see you on one day fitted with a husband, not till God make men of some other metal than earth. And that ain't gonna happen. There's the problem that she won't accept an earthly man. She wants some divine being that she's probably read about in poetry. Uh, uh, and similarly, Benedict uh, wants the perfect woman. Uh, uh, as he says, um, let's see. Uh, uh, when he says he, he's defining what he wants, rich she shall be, that's certain, wise or all none, virtuous or I'll never cheapen her, fair or I'll never look on her, mild or come not near me, noble or not I for an angel of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be what color it please God. That's it. The only detail he'll leave out that can be allowed to chance is her hair color. Otherwise, she has to check all the boxes of being the perfect uh, woman. Uh, and this is what Shakespeare is very concerned about when people want this uh, perfection in love. Uh, and so uh, what we get here is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, they make their love difficult. It's pretty clear they've met before. It's pretty clear that they're compatible. It's pretty clear that they actually love each other. But each one is afraid to make the first move. Uh, and they're trying to create obstacles for each other. Uh, Beatrice treats uh, uh, Benedict terribly so that uh, he'll have to prove himself to her. Uh, and similarly, uh, Benedict counters with uh, uh, nasty comments to Beatrice. Uh, the love is so perfect, they want it to seem difficult so they can prove something to each other. Uh, and you know, that, that horrible moment when uh, uh, Benedict asks Beatrice, what can I do for you? And she says, kill Claudio. And there it is. She wants a tragedy. I want some death here. Uh, and he's on the verge of doing it, much to uh, uh, Claudio's shock. Uh, uh, and we see something very similar uh, on the other side with Claudio uh, and Hero, uh, that uh, this is very much a young love. It's interesting that Shakespeare juxtaposes older people with Beatrice and Benedict, who frankly should know better, with the, the real phenomenon of young love. It does seem to be love at first sight on Clario's part. And he worships her. Uh, she's like an angel uh, to him. Uh, and uh, he over-idolizes her. He treats her as if she's not down to earth, if she's not, uh, she's not as God made her. And indeed he wants her to be an angel. And therefore he is too disposed to believe these accusations uh, that she has betrayed him. Uh, and it is uh, the kind of flip-flop that Shakespeare worries about uh, in love. You think a woman is an angel and if she's not absolutely perfect, then she's a whore. This is a pattern Shakespeare often shows. Uh, he sees it, I believe, as a kind of immaturity, characteristic of young men, that they over idolize women, can't incorporate their physicality, their sexuality in his image. You see this with Hamlet and Ophelia. Uh, he basically calls her a whore, get thee to a nunnery. Uh, you see it in Othello. Uh, Desdemona is absolutely perfect. Iago raises suspicions and suddenly she's a whore, uh, uh, treats her as if she's in a brothel. 
Uh, and this is the swing that Shakespeare worries about. Again, this would be the worry about over idealizing uh, love that it produces this overreaction. And what happens with Claudio uh, is really horrible. Uh, I mentioned it, but I'd like to read the passage now. It's, uh, 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 when he believes she's uh, uh, betrayed him. And at their wedding, he says, sweet prince, you've learned me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth could cunning sin cover itself with all. Comes not that blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue. Would you not swear, all you that see her, that she were a maid but these, by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed of blushes, guiltiness, not modesty. And there you see this overreaction, this woman he idealized, he now treats as if she's a whore. Now, this is a horrible moment. Uh, we especially react because we know he's deceived here and all this is untrue. But I want to say this is a horrible moment, even if it is true. No way to treat a lady at her wedding. Uh, to speak this way about her, and he will be punished for it with what appears uh, to be her death. Uh, and this is what, then her father comes along and to his daughter says, I wish you were dead. You've disgraced our family. Think of this as an honor killing in his mind. Uh, and uh, I think Shakespeare really is horrified by this and again it follows from over idealizing love you think you're doing a good thing but you're not in this world uh, uh even if uh, uh hero did what he thinks she did she deserves forgiveness at least give her a chance to be penitent about it maybe to confess uh what she's done which would be tough for her because she hasn't done it uh uh, but this is what I mean when Shakespeare says people get bent out of shape by the idea of love they've developed as if it's perfection. Shakespeare uh, uh, is trying to bring us down to earth uh, in our view of love. Again, uh, Benedict understands that uh, <laughs> the world must be peopled, and it's peopled by sexual generation. Or that wonderful thing he says at the end, man is a giddy thing. Uh, that's like, Lord, what fools these mortals be. Uh, that uh, Shakespeare understands, don't, don't have such a high opinion of yourself. Uh, don't be so high and mighty. Get off your high horse. Uh, and again, nothing makes us stupider than love. Uh, it's very inspiring and it uplifts it. But also, let's face it, the stupidest thing uh, women and especially men do are over love. And so that's what Shakespeare in comedy tries to do. It tries to bring us down to earth uh, and understand we're not perfect. Uh, we uh, are not uh, shaped with all the virtues, combine all the good qualities. And we have to, at some point, accept our humanity. And that's why the, the real comedians of this play are so important. Uh, and I'd like to finish by uh, talking about, about them and, and show you how they're integrated into this vision of life. Uh, because Shakespeare shows us all these high and mighty, highfalutin, honorable men uh, and by the way, they're all Spanish, and Shakespeare has something in for high-minded, chivalric Spanish people. I wish I had time to go into that in detail. Uh, but let's look, it's actually scene three, uh, uh, at this wonderful police force in Messina uh, as they're preparing for the night watch. And the second watch is, uh, uh, well, actually, Dogberry begins, this is your charge. You should comprehend all vagrant men. You would have bid any man stand in the prince's name. Seems like the watch-like thing to do. 
uh, how if he will not stand? Why then take no note of him, but let him go and presently call all the rest of the watch together and thank God you were rid of the knave. Uh, if he will not stand where he has been, he is none of the prince's subjects. True, and they are to meddle with none but the prince's subject. Uh, you shall also make no noise in the streets for the watch to babble uh, and to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. Uh, and it goes on and on like this. I look, uh, 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 we know what belongs watch. Why you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills be not stolen. Well, you were to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed. What if they will not? Why then, let them alone till they are sober. Uh, and this is such a different view of the world than the aristocrats of the play manifest. Uh, where again, anything goes wrong, a woman shows some weakness, she should be killed. Uh, let her die. In, in a way, it's such an intolerant view of humanity. Uh, and these common people have such a lesson uh, to teach uh, the, uh, the, the so-called uh, uplifted people in the play. Uh, that's why it's actually pointed out to them by the drunk man, Baraggio, uh, when he says to all our heroes, Don Pedro and Claudio, so, what your wisdoms could not discover these shallow fools have brought to light. That's always struck me as the greatest line in the play and embodying what's it about, your wisdoms. You the guys who think you rule the world, you're so smart the way you rule the world. You're trying to impose all these high moral standards on people who are after all just human beings. Uh, and what your wisdoms could not discover you were going to let this all go to hell. You were, people were going to die because of these shallow fools brought to light. This is a play, uh, and it's what makes it a comedy uh, that celebrates the shallow fools who are understanding, who are tolerant, uh, who don't get all bent out of shape over what they see uh, as evil in the world. And now, again, uh, Shakespeare does not simply take the side of shallow fools. He shows us very great individuals who stand up for things. I think of King Lear, for example, and his great uh, and royal concern for justice. Uh, but that's what makes him a tragic uh, a figure. Uh, Shakespeare is able to move between tragedy and comedy because he has an appreciation of what it is to be noble and to stand for great things. But he does see how that can get out of hand. And he has this complimentary vision of what uh, it is to accept life as it is. And I think in the area of love, uh, Shakespeare is particularly disposed to uh, uh, allow for that. Uh, the way I like to sum it up in terms of the difference between comedy and tragedy in Shakespeare is that in Shakespeare, in, in tragedy, uh, the great virtue is integrity. A tragic hero stands for something, will die for it. Uh, and the great uh, vice in the world of tragedy uh, is uh, compliancy, pliancy. It's giving in, it's compromising, it's selling out your cause. The flip flop of that though, is in comedy, the great vice is stubbornness. Uh, it's never varying your mind. It's, it's sticking to your position even when it's been proven to be ridiculous. And the great virtue in the world of comedy uh, is uh, versatility. Uh, it's flexibility. Uh, uh, tragic heroes create tragedy leading to death because they won't compromise. Comic heroes have to be flexible uh, and understand that man is a giddy thing uh, and the world must be uh, peopled uh, and they must go with the flow. So that for example, as we see with Claudio, he's really screwed things up with Hero. And you might think the play would just have him be reunited with Hero, but no, Shakespeare contrives it so that he must learn he's got to take 
his new wife sight unseen. And it's pretty weird, and who would ever do this? Promise to marry a woman he's never even seen when this is a guy who falls in love at first sight. But I think that's Shakespeare's exact point. No more bill of particulars, no more checking the boxes, no more knowing why this is going to be the perfect woman. You're going to marry her because <laughs> Leonardo tells you to marry her. And again, that's oh, that could only happen in a comedy. Uh, but I think it is the point, uh, the way uh, 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 he uh, yields here. Uh, and you see something similar in Benedict, the way he embraces what in tragedy would look like inconstancy, but in comedy looks like healthy flexibility. Uh, this is an act two, scene three, uh, uh, when he's, uh, 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 he now thinks that Beatrice loves him and he wants to love her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I've railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? He realizes a tragic hero. He's pledged never to get married, and he's got to stick by it no matter what happens. But he says, uh, doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth, and he cannot endure his age. Show quips and sentences, and these paper bullets of the brain, all man from the career's humor. No, the world must be people. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. That reminds me of Falstaff. The logic of that falls at the great example of flexibility, comic flexibility in Shakespeare. And this is his great recognition again, uh, man is a giddy thing. Uh, so that I think is what distinguishes the vision of Shakespeare in tragedy, as in Shakespeare in comedy. Uh, he knows there's a tragic aspect of life. He wrote the greatest tragedies ever written. Uh, uh, and he understands what nobility it is, it, nobility is and what it is to stand up for principle. Uh, but he also knows that leads to death uh, and unending conflicts in society. And so we can appreciate the other side of life where, you know, you compromise. You take the woman as she comes and don't ex uh, insist on this perfect woman with all the qualities. Uh, and that so often uh, that's the outcome of his co uh, romantic comedies. Substitution. The principle of Shakespearean comedy is accept no substitutes. There's one Juliet for Romeo. And if that doesn't work out, goodbye, cruel world, we're both dead. And again, there's something to be said for that. And Shakespeare gives as great an image of it as you ever could in Romeo and Juliet. But he also understands this is not the principle on which to found the human race, because uh, there's not going to be a human race uh, in another generation this way. And so the other side of Shakespeare, the comic side says, you know, yeah, accept substitutes. Move on in life. Don't get hung up. Uh, on, in this case, the perfect woman for Romeo. Uh, we see it at the beginning of the play when he uh, uh, leaves Rosaline for Juliet, but then Juliet is, absolute, is his absolute, and he never gets over that. Uh, uh, and that, again, is the world of Shakespeare and tragedy, where every experience is unique. Uh, but Shakespeare also has an understanding for common humanity, for people like Dogberry. Dogberry is so wonderful. Uh, he wants to be called an ass. He keeps saying, be sure to write me down an ass. Uh, someone says, uh, Dogberry, you're tedious. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I was trying so hard to be tedious. He's really dumb, but it means he, uh, he doesn't get all worked up over an insult these Don Pedros and these Don Johns, and, but they would go uh, arrange a duel if you called them an ass or called them tedious. Again, there's something to be said for honor. Well, the Spanish will always take it too far in Shakespeare's plays. But there's also to be something to be said, this marvelous dogberry who's just so happy to be called an ass. Uh, he's related to Nick Bottom who was transformed into an ass in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, I think Shakespeare, his comic understanding is that there's an ass side to humanity and, at, and we must learn to embrace it. Uh, so I think Mid, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is a great comedy. Much Ado About Nothing is also 
uh, a great Shakespearean comedy in his embracing of humanity in its very down to earth humanity. And that's why, you know, his tragedies are Shakespeare's greatest works, but his comedies are the necessary complement to them. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I think it might be time for some questions here. Oh, that, that was that was great. Okay, that was fantastic. Okay, we have um, we have a, a series of questions. Um, uh, one of the first questions was from uh, Reina Rodriguez. Um, I think that this came quite early in your lecture. I think she was curious about uh, what were the rules and norms relating to adultery during that time. Uh, I'm not sure if that means uh, Shakespeare's time or the or the time of the of the play uh, because I'm hearing love was then connected with religion and what if a woman committed adultery and they were married by church what were the rules and norms well again you say it's very complicated here because we'd have the question of how was adultery regarded in Shakespeare's day how was it regarded in the Messina which the play takes place and how was it regarded in the middle ages uh, the fact is we don't know that this contradictory evidence on such issues, you actually can find some legal cases and so on. Uh, but uh, there's a great debate about this whole phenomenon of courtly love, how real it was. It may have just been a literary fiction. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's reasonable to suppose that in the real world of the Middle Ages, adultery was severely punished. Uh, but it's very interesting to see what a fantasy role it plays in medieval literature. Uh, and I, I mean, a, 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 a adultery has been frowned upon in, in, in most societies uh, we know of. So in that sense, uh, or in a way, it's what Shakespeare is pointing to. There's a disconnect between the ordinary functioning of society where marriage is an important thing and especially uh, in the upper classes where dynasties are founded upon uh, 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 marriage uh, and sexual fidelity. Uh, uh, but I mean, Shakespeare sensed what an odd thing indeed that we had poetry celebrating adultery uh, in a way that would be unacceptable uh, in, in common life. So I, I, I think this is one of the things he's trying to do uh, in correct, uh, to, to, to correct uh, the uh, lack of realism of love poetry. Uh, you just can't go on celebrating uh, adultery. And again, I mentioned Edmund Spencer, uh, who you know, wrote his sonnets to his to his wife because he wanted to celebrate marriage, uh, which he uh, uh, thought was a good thing for the world. He uh, really, uh, and Cervantes gives a good sense of this in Don Quixote, in a way how crazy the world became because of the extrem extremism of these poetic views uh, uh, of love, which probably did not correspond much to any reality at the time. Okay. Um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Jonathan Jones, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure, uh, Jonathan Jones, is this our Jonathan? It might be our Jonathan. Uh, I'm sorry. In Act 4, Scene 1, when Beatrice demands, perhaps sarcastically, that Benedict kill Claudio, is Shakespeare alluding to the chivalric notion of love, of the perfect love for which Romeo and Juliet die, and maybe even uh, the love that requires one to kill another person? Yeah, I, I think you you mentioned that in your. In your yeah, in your I novel. mean, I think that's uh, it, it's amazing how much this play fl flirts with tragedy, and that means with death. Hero seems to die. Uh, Beatrice wants Claudio to uh, uh, wants. Uh, Benedict to kill Claudio. Uh, this is serious stuff. And I think Shakespeare's point is it's not worth it. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not worth dead bodies to maintain an artificially high standard, uh, particularly of fidelity. Uh, that this is, you know, this is the human race and, 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 
love does involve sexuality and it can make people do really stupid things uh, and unfortunate things, but you shouldn't kill them over it. Uh, again, measure for measure is all about this. Uh, oh, it's a character named Claudio there too, Isabella's uh, brother that he's uh, had sex uh, at a wedlock uh, uh, and the, the state is going to kill him. And I think Shakespeare found that over the top and he'd rather, <laughs> the police should be more like Dogberry's Force. Uh, you know, uh, just let people have their drinks and let, you know, let them be human beings and it's not going to be the end of the world if a couple of people have a few too many drinks on the streets of Messina. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, Professor David Livingston from Vancouver Island University. So that's, uh, we're, we've gone international. Um, uh, could you say a bit more about the lover's desire to promote themselves to make love unnecessarily difficult and its connection with Christianity? Why would the Christian tradition in particular inspire this reaction? And if possible, would you mind contrasting Shakespeare's treatment of this with Dante's depiction of Beatrice? Okay, first of all, let me say I love Vancouver Island. I've been to Tofino and I really know the area pretty well. Beautiful spot, I'd love to go back. Had the best Dungeness crab I've ever had in my life in Tofino and the best whale watching I ever did. Uh, so, but now to the serious question uh, here. Uh, again, what, what this love tradition inherits from the Christian tradition is the sense of martyrdom of suffering as a spiritualizing and elevating force. Uh, this is not what you find in the pagan understanding of, uh, uh, of love. Uh, uh, and it, it's really a radical rethinking of love, uh, which redirects it and makes lovers want to become famous for their tragedies. Again, I think this is Shakespeare understood from writing his own tragedies that you become famous uh, uh, for your deaths, for your suicide, for your suffering. Uh, and I, uh, uh, now in, in, in Dante's case, Dante really does uh, see uh, love as taking him on a Christian path. After all, Beatrice becomes his guide. Uh, uh, in paradise, uh, and this is the full uh, spiritualization of love. Shakespeare, uh, I think, is more skeptical about the possible reality of a Beatrice. Let me put it that way. Uh, his women, even the best of them, uh, tend to be more sexual than Dante's Beatrice uh, is. Uh, though who knows the truth about Dante? Uh, Yeats in a poem called Ego Dominus Tuis basically says, what a lecher Dante must have been to project such an ascetic religious image of himself. Uh, that, that Maybe a little projection on Yeats's part there. Uh, but uh, uh, in a way, we're in very different worlds of discourse where we're looking at Dante's divine comedy uh, and, and Shakespeare's romantic comedies. Of course, it's a very different notion of comedy Dante has this very Christian notion of comedy uh, that uh, story is tragic if it ends in hell and it's uh, 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 comic if it ends in paradise. And that was the goal that uh, Beatrice was going to bring him. Uh, uh, it is odd, I, I find it odd that uh, uh, very few literary critics have looked at the question of Dante's uh, influence on Shakespeare. I suspect he knew Dante quite well. Chaucer, we know, knew Dante. And Shakespeare probably read Italian, uh, as this play is some evidence of, because the chief source of it, which is a story by a man named Bandello, was not available in English, and Shakespeare probably read it in Italian. 
Uh, so I think there's a whole, I haven't had time to explore this, but I think it's an interesting area of study and uh, people get suspicious of me when I say, well, Shakespeare knew Italian. Well, he knew Latin very well. And so it's not that hard then to follow Italian. And I always say, if there's a gene for language in people, Shakespeare had the biggest one of any human being ever. He probably was very good at picking up languages. Uh, so it'll be really interesting. I really haven't tried to work out Shakespeare's relation to Dante, but I think there's some really interesting stuff there. Uh, Aaron Adame uh, asks, uh, what if any was the impact of King Henry VIII's behavior in his own marriages and mistresses on Shakespeare's attitude uh, and, and connection towards the idea of love match in marriage when in many cultures it was truly a contract between two families to increase land and power. Yeah, again, I think Shakespeare was a very practical man in that sense. I don't know specifically what his attitude towards Henry VIII was. I suspect uh, Shakespeare was pretty tolerant in his view of humanity in general. I think he sympathized with the old boy and, and understood what his uh, motives were. were. Uh, uh, it is so strange about the English monarchy when uh, people got so bent out of shape about the divorce of uh, uh, which pr pr Prince Charles and Diana that, you know, it's a monarchy that was founded on an act of divorce uh, back in the times of Henry uh, VIII. Uh, I, I, will, I do not think that Shakespeare was a moralistic person. Uh, I don't think morality was the most important thing in life for him. Uh, I suspect he might have agreed with William Blake when Blake says, I care not whether a man be good or evil. I care only whether he be a wise man or a fool. Uh, I think that's Shakespeare's attitude uh, towards uh, human life. And I think he, uh, you know, he understood both the human reality of King Henry's love life and, of course, the deeper uh, politics of it. And uh, again, I do think that for Henry, the divorce of Catherine of Aragon was a, uh, 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 a real politic move. He was more interested in founding uh, the Church of England than he was in getting the divorce. By the way, I would just bring up the fact that he was married to Catherine of Aragon, and we have Pedro of Aragon in this play, and I wish I had time to go into it, but there's all these uh, complications of its being said in Sicily that take this play to view the, uh, 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 the English attitude towards Spain. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, Sicily during Shakespeare's lifetime and when this play is set, was ruled by Spain. There was no Italy. So Sicily wasn't a part of Spain. Essentially the Habsburg uh, family owned Sicily. And at one point they gave it to the uh, King of Spain. Uh, and so there's all these references uh, in the play that including the, uh, uh, this bastard John is actually John of Austria, the illegitimate son of Emperor Charles V. Uh, and the man who led the Christian uh, naval forces at the Battle of Lepanto and who contemplating, contemplated uh, 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 invading England and marrying Mary, Queen of Scots. So this play has all sorts of implications for English politics. And I think uh, Shakespeare is really enjoying making fun of the punctiliousness in honor of all these Spaniards, because this is exactly what the English found so funny and often uh, traduced uh, on the stage, uh, bring out characters speaking uh, stage Spanish. Uh, and so there's a whole nother dimension to the play there. Again, I felt I had to work it in a bit here. I'd love to give a whole lecture on that sometime. Uh, uh, Professor Massimoni here at, at South Texas College asks, uh, please comment on Margaret and Baraccio's relationship. Whoa. I've never really thought about that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a low life thing. Uh, and again, it shows you the difference in the classes in this world uh, that for good or ill, the upper classes 
impose much higher standards on themselves than the lower classes do. Uh, obviously, uh, this this is a non-marriage of convenience. Uh, that is, it, it largely exists uh, for sexual reasons, uh, like the romance of uh, Touchstone and Audrey in As You Like It. And obviously, it's another case of men mistreating women uh, and forcing Margaret to do something one hopes she had objections to. Uh, uh, and again, the whole life at this social level uh, in this world uh, does not live up uh, to very high standards. And uh, Baraccio is a very um, objectionable character, but it's it's really interesting. And I think the uh, both the movies I talked about make this clear. He's really shocked when he hears of Hero's death. And it leads him to, for once in his life, to do the right thing uh, and actually confirm what might have been left in doubt had he not spoken up uh, when he does. And this is, again, Shakespeare. Shakespeare has no illusions about common people. And in fact, he tends to present them comically uh, and, and quite honestly shows how stupid they are often. Uh, on the other hand, he really has a sense of their decency. I think in King Lear, the servant of Cornwall, uh, when he sees how Cornwall's treating Gloucester and he just kills Cornwall. He just can't take it anymore. And I, I think, that, again, you can say that Shakespeare despised the common people and there'd be a lot of evidence uh, in a place that effect, but uh, you know, what your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools brought to light. There is, and again, Baraccio is part of that in that he just, he's kind of a living of a reproach to these noblemen and how they act. And I think Shakespeare has that sense of, uh, they're common, but it's a source of a common decency. But again, the way he treats uh, uh, Margaret is, 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 is horrible and typical. I mean, this is not a world that is uh, sympathetic to women. And I think Shakespeare understood, again, this is an aspect of what he disliked about this whole medieval conception of the world that it elevated women to the status of angels, but treated them like garbage. Uh, that, you know, on paper, in literature, women were these angels, but in practice, uh, they're obviously sexual objects uh, for these men. They are not treated with any respect. You know, you call a woman an angel and then treat her like a whore. Uh, and I, again, it's this inner contradiction uh, of this, this whole view of love that tries to over-spiritualize it and then lets men treat actual women as if they're dirt uh, to be used for their purposes, which often are not much more than sexual. Uh, uh, there's something very ugly actually about the relationship between uh, uh, Baraccio and, and, and Margaret. And so often you see that in Shakespeare's uh, plays and uh, he himself wanted something more happy medium the woman's not an angel but she's not a whore and treat her like a human being okay. uh, Rich asks and, and this might be uh, one of our professors here um, uh, is, is Shakespeare's audience in on the satire he adds, he adds to that how do we reconcile a satiric view of the conventions of love with the seemingly real problem of fidelity of female chastity during the English Renaissance and, and frankly today, would Shakespeare's audience mock or understand Claudio's disdain for Hero, Leonardo's wish that Hero die for shaming the family and Beatrice's requirement that Benedict kill for her? No, that's a, that's a really good point uh, that in some ways Shakespeare is challenging uh, the views of his own time, uh, but I think he is. Uh, and I, I, re I really struck me again in watching both movies, how horrible uh, 
Claudia's behavior is at their wedding. Uh, and it's it's their wedding, God damn it. Uh, I mean, you know, just maybe say something nasty in private to her, but it's just so gratuitous the way he tries to humiliate her. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I really think uh, we're supposed to react that way and that Shakespeare was always willing to challenge his audience uh, and was skilled enough that he could shape a drama to make people think anew about issues. Uh, and uh, again, I, I think there's far too much effort to moralize Shakespeare and turn his plays into simple moral lessons. Uh, whereas I think he's trying to teach a kind of broader humanity uh, and uh, particularly in, in, in regard uh, uh, to something as basic to human life <clears throat> as sexuality and love. And again, I think, uh, you know, uh, Dogberry's tolerance, I know, I know he's dumb and, and he's a low life, uh, but that's Shakespeare's cleverness to find the wisdom in the low lives. And again, what your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools brought to light that I think Shakespeare is showing there. Uh, and again, this is in the spirit of Erasmus and the praise of folly and a whole attitude in the Renaissance that there's something to be learned from fools. Uh, and of course, that's so true with the fool in King Lear and all the fools uh, in Shakespeare. Uh, 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 by the way, Dogberry, we know from the uh, stage directions, was played by Will Kemp, Shakespeare's greatest comedian, uh, and the man who created Falstaff, for one thing. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the wisdom of the world is foolishness, the foolishness of the world is wisdom. Uh, I, I don't think Shakespeare ever hesitated going against the common opinions of his day. He was so talented uh, that he could do it in an inoffensive way. This play does not preach, and Shakespeare never preaches, unlike some of his critics. Uh, and so I, I think the whole genius of comedy for Shakespeare is that it comes in under the ra radar. You don't know you're being taught something, but you're being taught something. And in a way, it operates on the simple level of dramatic sympathy. Uh, uh, I think this play creates great sympathy for Hero as someone who's been wrong. And if you can just learn that, maybe you won't be so moralistic in your judgment uh, of women. Uh, and again, Shakespeare, and, uh, uh, by the way, one thing I'm saying tonight is Shakespeare's comedy is a lot more serious than we normally think. And this is not much ado about nothing. It's much ado about a very serious subject. And again, I'll stress that it's one that was very much at home for Shakespeare because it involved uh, life imitating art in the case of literary views of love. Uh, uh, and uh, again, in some ways we can learn more about human life from Shakespeare's comedies than we can from his tragedies, because the tragedies deal with exceedingly exceptional human beings, uh, whereas the comedies deal with the dog berries of the world. Uh, and there's a lot more dog berries than there are King Lear's. And even King Lear needed a fool by his side. Okay, uh, I'll um, one more question from the, uh, from the, um, the, the chat here, and then I'll turn to uh, Professor Hutchins. Um, uh, Dr. Lang asks, uh, if Shakespeare is debunking courtly love in this play, does that, does that extend to, uh, extend, I guess, to a debunking of marriage and fidelity to some degree as well? One of the keys to Don John's plan is that Hero must not be in a room between 12 and 1 the night before the wedding. And as it turns out, she's not. Also, we found out later that Beatrice did not sleep in Hero's room as she, was, she has done for the last year. These facts lend cre uh, credibility to the accusations against Hero on the day of the wedding. 
where uh, were Hero and Beatrice that night? Oh, I love questions. This is in the how many children do the Macbeths have uh, category. Uh, let me say this. Shakespeare's comedies are a celebration of marriage. Uh, what he most objects to in the idea of courtly love is that true love is incompatible with marriage. And Shakespeare's comedies end with marriages. And those are happy endings, contrary to what one of my, many of my feminist colleagues claim, uh, that, that the, the ending of Shakespeare's comedies are really tragic because they end in marriages. Uh, 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 but I, you know, I think uh, uh, Shakespeare thought marriage was a healthy institution. Uh, and again, it's a way of directing this very irrational force, Eros, this force of love, to a socially legitimate function, which is the world must be peopled. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, again and again, uh, what Shakespeare shows is that people have created false impediments. Beatrice and Benedict should get married. And they need a lot of help in that. Uh, and what stands in the way of it is their pride. Uh, uh, you see it, the males in this play are so afraid of being called cuckolds. Uh, uh, it's their great fear and Beatrice, uh, excuse me, Benedict won't even get married out of the fear of becoming a cuckold. I think Shakespeare sees that as really, really silly uh, and trying to overcome it. That's why he gravitates towards characters like Dogberry who are willing to be called ass. Basically, in the case of Dogberry, he really has internalized sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never harm me. Whereas the highfalutin courtiers of the play, it's exactly what harms them as names. They are too concerned with names, with unrealities. Uh, uh, and, uh, again, you know, I suspect that Shakespeare was not, uh, he didn't make as much of fidelity and love as, say, Othello did. And that's what he's portraying in that play. Uh, that uh, again, it's 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 hard to see this, but uh, even if Iago is right, a fellow shouldn't kill Desdemona. It's not that he he kills an innocent woman; it's that he kills a woman. That's bad enough, uh, uh, and over something that's not great and you know in some ways marriage dictates fidelity that's the point of what marriage is uh but not this absolute conception uh where desdemona would be damned by one action and if you ask me i don't believe shakespeare believed in damnation just as dogberry doesn't uh uh, uh, you know, there's this great question uh, to understand all is to despise all or to understand all is to embrace all. I think Shakespeare's in that embrace car category that what he showed is this deep wisdom about humanity that he could accept human beings in their greatness and in their failings. In his tragedies, he portrays human beings in their greatness and in their unwavering, uncompromising uh, greatness, but that takes them to their deaths. Uh, but, the, you know, it's a great paradox that Shakespeare could write comedies and tragedies. There's virtually nobody else in the history uh, of drama, the history of literature that was as good at comedy as at tragedy. Now we have the fact that Sophocles and Euripides could write satire plays, and they're actually pretty funny, but they were fundamentally tragedians, and Aristophanes was fundamentally a comedian. And you can look far and long. Uh, Thomas Middleton's about the only one of Shakespeare's contemporaries 
who could write comedy and tragedy equally well. Ben Jonson's tragedies are just awful. Sejanus and Catiline, they're unreadable, whereas he was a genius at comedy. Uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe didn't write comedy, so they could... Well, actually, they had to bring in uh, uh, Samuel Rowley to write the comic scenes in Dr. Faustus because Marlowe couldn't, couldn't handle it. But it's very interesting that Shakespeare not only alternated between comedy and tragedy from work to work, but within uh, his comedies, uh, within his tragedies, he famously had comic relief, but I believe he had comic, tragic relief in his comedies. And you can see it in Much Ado About Nothing. There are scenes that, again, the scene of that wedding is virtually at the level of a Shakespearean tragedy in terms of the intensity of it. And I think the reason he was able to alternate between comedy and tragedy is that along with his acute sense of human greatness, which is unparalleled in the history of literature, he had this sense of the common failings of human beings uh, that he did not treat moralistically and he did not treat as sin or as worthy of damnation. Uh, and it's why he's such a great dramatist that he truly embraces it all. And in some ways, his comedies teach that better than his tragedies do. So I'm all in favor of, you know, paying attention to his comedies. Uh, Professor Hutchins? Sorry, I was unmuting. Um, Listening to your talk, I, I realize I'm, I'm getting a wider and deeper view of the character of Hero than I had before. Uh, if we look at the two women, uh, main women in the play, uh, we see Beatrice, we see her wit and her intelligence and her pride, as you say, and we see Hero, or I did, is a just a sweet lovely young lady who is not only wronged in her reputation but is treated as brutally as you can imagine by her fiance right uh, the man who's supposed to be her husband but we do see um claudio's remorse um, when he finds out, at least, that Hero's been wronged. And at first, it, it, it's almost hard to understand her reaction as she gets sent off to wait in a convent for him, that she's not more reacting more the, the hell with him. I'll get him. But we see with remorse in Claudio, but then the thought occurs to me that Shakespeare lets us see forgiveness in Hero. And not a way I was thinking of her character before. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I, I, I would add to the equation here the fact that uh, uh, I think she loves Claudio. Uh, and in that sense, would like to marry him and would like to get out of this dead end they've ended up in. And in a certain sense, she shows a kind of wisdom in doing that. I mean she could get up on her high horse now and berate Claudio and, and insist on some penance he performed. Uh, and yet, in a way, she does the healthiest thing. Uh, you know, again, you can imagine Shakespeare writing a scene when she discovers uh, how Claudio agreed to marry this face. Woman. What do you mean you were going to yes. marry the first woman that came <laughs> along? Uh, don't you love me? You're supposed to love me, me, and only me. And uh, where would that get her? Uh, I, I mean, the, uh, the, that's tragedy. That's what produces tragedy in Shakespeare. Uh, when people can't get over it. And, you know, there's something very noble about Shakespeare's characters who can't move on, who can't get over it, uh, who stick to their guns. That's why I say the great virtue in Shakespeare and tragedy is integrity. 
but there's a kind of cunning wisdom to flexibility which says, you know, I can stand on principles uh, till I'm blue in the face, but then I'll never be married and I'll never have this man I love and we'll never have children and so on. Uh, and that's the wisdom of comedy in Shakespeare. Uh, you know, I call it flexibility, uh, uh, the very opposite of stubbornness. And it's funny, uh, we're so used to uh, people sticking to their guns in drama, because that's what generates conflict. That we're often saying, well, no one would do that. Uh, why did she do that? And yet, think about it in real life. People you've known who've, something's terrible happened, but, but they get over it and they move on. Uh, that's the great spirit of Shakespeare's final plays. The final plays are all about moving on. Winter's Tale is about the same issue of jealousy and sexual fidelity and so on, and learning to move on. And, not, and so it's very interesting that Shakespeare in his last play uh, explores this genre of tragic comedy. It's really flirting with it already, much ado about nothing. That Shakespeare's final plays are all about moving on. It, it, it may be no accident that their final plays, that he was very much thinking about moving on at that point uh, in his life. But the Tempest is all about forgiveness and this dark thing, I acknowledge mine. Uh, and the, you know, there's a generosity of spirit in Shakespeare that I think you see in the plays themselves. Uh, uh, again, if you know the Tempest, uh, when Caliban walks in uh, and, and says, uh, oh, brave, uh, uh, is it brave Caliban? New yeah, brave new world that has such people. That, uh, uh, and it's a sense of wonder about things that we know are pretty ordinary, and in some cases, uh, pretty repellent. But I think Shakespeare has that talent to make us look at the world and say, oh, brave new world about it. Uh, uh, I, I have to ask about the heroic mystery, uh, Lewis Carroll's heroic mystery. Um, uh, so he, he famously asks, uh, where was Hero that night, if not in a room, and uh, why doesn't she or Beatrice provide an alibi? You know, the, the famous uh, Lewis Carroll mystery. Uh, <laughs> You're showing you're a student of Leon Cray here. Uh, that's an in-joke. Uh, but uh, I'm not as impressed as Leon is with these things, these mysteries. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, I don't think Shakespeare is Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, and I think that, you know, again, that's asking a kind of question that I have to say, I personally don't ask about uh, Shakespeare's plays. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a dramatic necessity that's going on here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, okay. um, I don't find that line of questioning fruitful. Okay. Um uh, so much of uh, there's uh, as you're giving your thesis, I was thinking about all 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 the sorts of evidence that could add to it. Uh, the song, uh, absolutely. Hey, Nani, Nani, you're absolutely right. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, please. Uh, well, I mean, in a way, the uh, where is that song? Now? Let me... I mean, in the film version, they actually in the, uh, oh, the yeah. Kenneth Branagh film version, they actually start with it, right? But it's it's right before Benedict uh, is is tricked. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is so perfect. Uh, it's an Act Two, Scene Three. Sigh no more, ladies. Sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. You know, that's the world of tragedy. We got to leave it. Men are deceivers. You're sighing. One foot in sea and one on shore to one thing constant never. Then sigh not so, but let them go and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nanny, nanny. That's what Shakespeare does in comedy. He converts the sounds of woe into hey, nanny, nanny. It's actually used brilliantly in the film. Uh, and it, it, it is the sense that learn to laugh at it. Uh, 
uh, uh, it's just not worth dwelling on the tragedy, endlessly dwelling on the tragedy of the world. Uh, and this is the greatest tragedian who ever lived telling us this. Shakespeare's world would be so much diminished if we didn't have the comedies. Uh, I think Shakespeare understands that tragedy is a moment. It's a moment of intensity, of unparalleled intensity, and we cannot live human lives uh, uh, focused purely on tragedy. Uh, that's why he ends his career with these four tragic comedies, uh, uh, the life going beyond uh, the world beyond tragedy uh, uh, and showing that, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, uh, King Lear, if he, it's a mercy when he dies, uh, because how could you continue life after seeing Cordelia die and so on? And yet Prospero in a way is Lear having survived tragedy and is rewarded by being reunited with his daughter. Uh, uh, and the, the, the tragedies show us these moments of loss, but they are moments. Uh, uh, the German poet Goethe understood this. The second part of Faust uh, uh, opens with the character of Ariel from Shakespeare's The Tempest. And Faust has undergone an intense tragedy. He's seen his beloved Gretchen die before his eyes uh, in end of part one. And to move on, because there's got to be a part two, uh, he needs Shakespeare's Ariel uh, to give him a fresh start and a way, way to wipe the slate clean uh, and, and get life going again. And you know, this, this sounds in a way so artificial, but it's actually a very human phenomenon. The artificiality is the neatness of death in tragedy. Shakespeare's tragic heroes die when it's good for them to die, uh, when they can't go on. But yet human life, fortunately or unfortunately, is not that neat and you often don't die when you've witnessed a great tragedy or participate in one. And it's an amazing thing about human beings that they pick themselves up, put themselves back together and move on. And that resilience is something I think Shakespeare understood and portrays in his comedies. Again, they're about resilience. Uh, uh, the tragic hero is rigid and is put under incredible stress and breaks. The comic hero bends and bounces back. And there's something lower about that. It does always involve compromise uh, and uh, doing things that kind of look ignominious to us, uh, but there's always life. Uh, and Shakespeare has a sense for that, that life itself has a kind of value that can at least weigh against the nobility of death and tragedy. Uh, it's really interesting, this play, then kill Claudio. That moment is so out of keeping with a uh, comedy. Uh, and again, you know, Dogberry would never kill Claudio. Uh, yeah, he just, you know, maybe uh, lies about to do the thing again. But uh, uh, and Shakespeare's comedies reveal a very human world in which the proper response is not kill Claudio, even though we can really feel that way after what he's done to Hero. Uh, and, and Shakespeare is so in control of language and dramatic means that he can bend us any way he chooses uh, so that if he wanted us to root for killing Claudio, we would be doing it. Uh, but he creates a world here where actually we don't want to see Benedict kill Claudio because then we got some legal problems in Messina. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, you've sort of hinted a little bit at the setting and how it works with your with your thesis. Um, uh, well, in particular, the 
the Spanish uh, uh, tradition. Um, could you say more about the setting, particularly the physical setting, Messina? Okay, that well, you know, uh, the Christian uh, Armada set out from Messina on the way to the Battle of Lepanto, uh, and it was commanded by John of Austria, the bastard son of Charles V. I don't know how in the world Shakespeare could have expected his audience not to know this. I've been to Messina. Uh, it's not as nice as Vancouver Island and the Dungeness Crab is nowhere near as good. There is, however, a statue of Don John of Austria yeah. in the middle of downtown uh, Messina. I have a photograph of it. Uh, uh, they celebrated the man who conquered uh, the Turkish fleet and thereby preserved Christian Europe and prevented the Turks from dominating the Mediterranean. In that sense, the background of this play is the late Crusades, if I may put it that way. Uh, if we want to go back to medieval roots here and the whole idea of chivalry, uh, everything I've said about courtly love, chivalry is part and parcel of a world that held up uh, as the great goal, uh, crusades against the Turks to recover the Holy Land. So the chivalric spirit, the crusading spirit, very much associated uh, with Messina. Uh, and so in that, this is a comedy, and so it doesn't go in to the deep politics of it. But in a way, it shows you the relationship between uh, what's wrong with the spirit of chivalry and love and what was wrong with the spirit of chivalry in politics that had led to this crusading uh, spirit. Uh, and, I, you know, just add to it, I mean, the, the whole history of Sicily, it was the crossroads of the Mediterranean. It was conquered by everybody and his brother at one point or another. Uh, and it was a, it was a Don Pedro who kicked uh, the French out of Sicily uh, uh, and brought it under Spanish rule. It was after the famous Sicilian Vespers, which Verdi wrote an opera about. There's so much stuff here with regard to Sicily and don't even get me started on The Godfather, which I believe was Shakespeare's favorite movie. Uh, but, uh, 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 but the whole world of Messina conjures up Lepanto uh, and these wars that you know plunge the Mediterranean into chaos for centuries over religion. Uh, uh, and by the way, who fought at the Battle of Lepanto? Miguel Cervantes uh, uh, lost the use of his right arm at the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, and so there's all sorts of strange things come together here. Uh, uh, Messina is a fascinating little place. Uh, it's where the Straits of Messina are. And if you just cross there, that's where Scylla and Charybdis legendarily were. And if you cross here in Reggio Calabria in Italy, and you can go see the Riachi Bronzes, two of the most beautiful survivals of the ancient world, two of the most perfectly preserved uh, life-size bronze statues. Uh, so I was very happy to go to Messina and get over to see the Riachi Bronzes. But what, a, what, an, imp what an incredibly historic and uh, you know, it's where Ram, uh, excuse me, where Montgomery and General Patton raced to get to Messina to be the first to cross over into mainland Italy. What a fascinating spot it is. And I think it's a, it does appear that Shakespeare's aware of this. How in the world does he have a Don John the Bastard uh, in this play uh, when a Don John the Bastard commanded the Christian fleet? Uh, at the Battle of Lepanto. By the way, if you go to Barcelona, uh, I miss traveling, so I have to bring this all out at this point. Go to Barcelona, to the Maritime Museum in Barcelona. They claim to have Don John's flagship uh, uh, from the Battle of Lepanto. This guy was very famous. Uh, 
uh, he uh, uh, twice he planned a pre Armada invasion of Sp of England. It really was the prototype. Uh, once it was going to be uh, uh, from France, but once from the Netherlands. Uh, he conquered uh, the uh, uh, Tunis at one point. Uh, he, he died fairly young. I think he was 37. He, let me read you a tribute from the Pope uh, to Don John. I didn't think I'd get to him, uh, but we got to do something to make up the fact that he got played by Keanu Reeves in a movie. <laughs> uh, but this is Gregory the 13th writing to Don, uh, about Don John in 1572, eight months after Lepanto. That young chief has proved himself a Scipio in valor, a Pompey in heroic grace, an Augustus in good fortune, a new Moses, a new Gideon, a Samson, a new Saul, a new David, without any of the faults of these famous men. And I hope to God to live long enough to reward him with a royal crown. This, by the way, is from a wonderful book by Richard Paul Rowe called The Shakespeare Guide to Italy, <coughs> from which I found out all these things about uh, John the Bastard. And the tension between uh, John and Pedro at the beginning of the play may be over the uh, illusion here. Don John wanted to become a king. His father promised it to him. And indeed, uh, 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 he... Uh, Philip II uh, ordered Don John uh, to conquer Tunis and then raise it to the ground because he saw that as a great threat to Christian control of the Mediterranean, that there was this North African city that potentially controlled the middle of the Mediterranean, including Sicily. And instead, uh, Don John fortified uh, the city of Tunis, hoping to become the new king of Tunis. Uh, and this guy Rose speculates that that's the uh, the uh, 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 real source of the tension here. I don't uh, I don't know if Shakespeare knew that, but Don John was very famous at the time and famous in England uh, as as a deep threat to England at several points. He was sent in to clean up the situation in the Netherlands which as you may know, was ruled by Spain uh, at this time. Uh, and he, he was kind of a hitman for the Habsburg mafia. Uh, and again, you know, send the bastard in, send Sonny. And I told you I connect with, with the Godfather, uh, but, uh, but he was a very famous man. We've never heard of him. Uh, again, I first heard of him when I went to Barcelona and the Maritime Museum there. And then I was very angry. I read there was a statue of him in Messina and I tracked it down. Uh, so he was a famous man. The fact that Shakespeare includes this in this play gives this whole Spanish dimension to it. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, the English hated the Spaniards. Uh, before, but especially after the Armada and their image of the Spaniards. And you can see this, you can see it, for example, in Ben Johnson's play, The Alchemist. They see the Spaniards as these prancing dandies uh, who have such a sense of their honor. Uh, uh, and I, I think this play appealed to the Elizabethan audience for the way it portrayed uh, the Spanish in it as getting tripped up on their own absurdly high sense of their honor. So again, I'm glad I was able to bring this up because half my preparation for this talk was studying the history of Don John of Austria. Fascinating figure. Yeah, and, and in the play, I mean, he's, I mean, he's the villain. He's not terribly smart. Um, he doesn't strike one as terribly smart. He has to have the other uh, Baraccio and Conrad have to explain to him how the plans are going to work, like why why this is going to be able to he'll be able to take advantage of this and get his revenge on 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 uh, Don uh, Don Pedro, but um, uh, uh, yeah, he's a I don't I I I didn't think Keanu Reeves acted particularly well, but I thought he was typecast well. <laughs> He he spent a whole career being type typecast as good looking. 
uh, but the, the, the depth is somehow sadly lacking as acting, with the possible exception of my own private Idaho. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I was wondering if, if you could uh, push more on the, um, on the, okay, so the, um, either the virtue um, that Benedict and Beatrice show or the problem uh, for men and women, like if you could accentuate um, either the problem uh, that men uh, is exactly the same or is it different? Are there, are there, are there important differences to, to draw out uh, in the problem of idealizing love? Well, I mean, Shakespeare does write largely from the perspective of men and this literary tradition is solely from the perspective of men. I mean, it's about how a man idealizes this beautiful woman who's his mistress. All the poets are themselves men. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to think if there's any, even any place that this is reversed uh, uh, with a woman having a, uh, I guess the, the so-called patient Griselda motif, uh, 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 where you have this woman who's mistreated by a man and and is the patient Griselda. Uh, she stays in love with him and waits for him. I mean, that right there shows you uh, how women are given a lesser status, a much more passive role. Uh, so... Uh, 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 you know, in, uh, uh, in, in Shakespeare's body of work, Cleopatra is by far the most interesting female character he ever created. And there, to some extent, the situation is flipped and you see her worshiping Mark Antony uh, as a god and feeling rejected and, in a sense, playing with him. And so, uh, so but, but that's long after this. Uh, what I will say is in other, in other comedies, uh, you have a figure like Rosalind in As You Like It, who is given a very active role uh, and understands she's got to educate her lover because he's a dumb man. And so uh, Mira Flaumenhoft has a wonderful essay in As You Like It, where she points out uh, Rosalind just teaches Orlando punctuality. There are whole sequences where the only thing she's teaching him is show up when I tell you to show up. Uh, you want to know what love is? It's punctuality. Uh, and there's, there's, again, there's a kind of deep truth to that. Uh, the, half the problems uh, between men and women are just coordinating their time schedules. Uh, and Rosalind learns to dominate uh, of that. Uh, uh, and, you know, in, in, uh, uh, I, I, I once read this thing on Amazon.com. So I can't cite it properly, but it was someone commenting on it. And it said, for Shakespeare, tragedy is when men rule the world. Comedy is when women rule the world. And there is a real truth to that empirically, uh, that in love, Shakespeare presents women as problem solvers and men as problem creators. Uh, that that uh, the, it's usually the men who generate these obstacles to the love. And women are looking for solutions and often achieve them. And you can say it's a comedy where the women get to achieve the solutions they have in mind. And part of it is uh, women are, broadly speaking, more concerned with generation than men because they want to have children and they want to be mothers. And so what they do is uh, they, they see marriage as a goal and they they plan on it. They plan on capturing men, uh, and it is inter yeah, interesting in this play. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, how much more successful the women are in bringing Beatrice and Benedict uh, uh, together. And there's a profound association in Shakespeare between comedy and women, and that sounds demeaning, but it's not. Uh, that is, you have to understand the larger role of comedy and Shakespeare, why it's very important to him. 
that the fact that human beings come up with solutions to their problems, that's not the worst thing you can ever say about human beings. And so these clever women like Portia in Merchant of Venice or above all Rosalind uh, in As You Like It uh, uh, or Viola in Twelfth Night uh, uh, that uh, faced with this usual mess that the men get into often precisely because of their exaggerated Petrarchan view of uh, the world, the women uh, uh, solve things. And I, uh, this will sound ugly if I, I say it, but it's almost a variant of what these, what your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools brought to life. If you substitute women for that, you've actually got the formula uh, for a number of Shakespeare's comedies. And I don't want to say that means women are shallow fools quite the opposite. Uh, it is there's a wisdom in their willingness to make life work uh, and not target death as the solution. I mean, that's what, uh, again, Romeo and Juliet are so wonderful, but did they really have to die? I remember when, uh, at the time of the DiCaprio, Claire Danes movie, uh, uh, I heard one of my students, my Shakespeare class, uh, saying, uh, uh, oh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, but did they really have to die at the end? It's so sad. And, you know, I thought, you know, you know, what part of the concept of tragedy did they not tell you about? But in a way, she was right to say that, that uh, uh, and Shakespeare's comedies show the world where Romeo and Juliet don't die. Uh, where they bend uh, they go with the flow, and it's not the worst outcome in wor world to have two people happily married. I think if I if I could leave some message from Shakespeare's plays, uh, uh, it, it, it really you know I, I have colleagues who who say that the Jane Austen's novels are tragic because they end with marriages. Uh, and I think that's a very un-Jane Austen-like comment on what's going on. But, but there's a profound yeah. parallel between Jane Austen's novels and Shakespeare's romantic comedies. Often shows the exact same th things going on, how lovers have to overcome pride and prejudice and other things that they, they generate the obstacles in their love. And they've got a novel titled Persuasion. This is all about the virtues of persuasion in solving human problems. Uh, uh, and again, you know, pride and prejudice is the world of Shakespeare's tragedies. Persuasion is the world of his comedies. Uh, 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 so the, uh, again, Portia and Rosalind would be the best example, but there's a, a great deal of wisdom uh, to Shakespeare's women and especially in the comedies. And it's and their role appears to be passive, but really it's active. Uh, and they're constantly outwitting these really smart men who, as Shakespeare shows, only think they're smart uh, and don't know what the solution is for them. Uh, uh, and again, I, I, I know Shakespeare is a man and he's not supposed to be able to understand women, but he created some of the greatest female characters in world literature. Uh, and it, it, it's because he could get out of himself and embrace uh, different types of life. Uh, and, uh, and again, you, uh, uh, you can't appreciate the totality of Shakespeare or say anything about his view of women uh, I, I taught a course on Shakespeare's Roman plays, which are all tragedies in the fall. And quite honestly, the women in the class, you know, were saying, oh, the women have subordinate roles. Uh, Shakespeare doesn't like women. I said, I wish we could do some of the comedies uh, and you could see the whole of Shakespeare uh, and how wide embracing uh, his view of humanity is. So I really, tonight I've been pushing the comedies. But I'll tell you this, King Lear is not a bad play. Uh, 
Hamlet's pretty good too. Uh, but <laughs> but but you know we need to say more about the comedies, and that's what I tried to show tonight that they really do have a depth uh, to them, and and in some ways deal more profoundly with the phenomena of love than the than the tragedies do. Uh, where the tragedies the tragedies portray a moment of tragedy, uh, but human life as a whole is not all tragedy, and it's not all isolated moments. The the, the tragedies point fundamentally to discontinuity. The comedies point fundamentally to continuity. Continuity of the line, you know, marriage, children, generation, continuity of the state, the community, uh, in the tragedies, the community is torn apart. Uh, the best and most impressive members of the community die or are somehow expelled from the community. Tragedy's movement is exclusive. Uh, comedy's movement is inclusive. Uh, and you learn to bring people back into the community. Uh, you, uh, they momentarily err, they stray somehow, but they have to be the gesture at the end. Uh, you know, it's death in a tragedy, it's marriage in a comedy. Uh, uh, comedy is uh, an integrative uh, genre. It brings the community uh, back together at the end and in a way that's symbolized by a marriage which always is a communal uh, uh, celebration for Shakespeare. Uh, it's very strongly so in Much Ado About Nothing. There's that dance at the end of a comedy where the community pairs off uh, and, and, and comes together. Uh, uh, and it sings Hey Nani Nani. That is so perfect. That, uh, uh, and that's Much Ado About Nothing. Hey, nani, nani are, are nonsense syllables, but Shakespeare understands a lot of human life is nonsense, uh, and especially when sex gets involved. Uh, uh, and, and you better appreciate the nonsense and celebrate the nonsense. Uh, don't dwell on the irrationality of it. And if people call you an ass, proudly write yourself down as an ass, because... <laughs> We are asses. Lord, what fools these morals be. Uh, and in the case of Nick Bottom, he gets to meet the queen of the fairies and the result, he ends up with asses ears. It's such a perfect image uh, of transformation. By the way, this play is all about transformation. It's filled with Ovidian imagery. Uh, uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis may have been Shakespeare's favorite book. It's all about gods turning into human beings, gods turning into beasts, beasts turning into gods, human beings turning into gods. That's what goes on in this play and that Benedict finally realizes when he, when he admits, you know, I, I changed my taste in meat. Uh, do me something. Uh, you know, do, uh, so I'm not consistent. Uh, uh, a lot of the problems of the characters in this play come from trying to be too consistent. Now, again, it's great to be consistent. Uh, 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 it is that tragic virtue of integrity. Uh, it's what uh, Benedict fears. I've been proudly a bachelor all these lives, all these, all my life. My friends are going to just ridicule me if I now get married is that any reason not to get married is that an adequate reason to sacrifice what might be the happiness of your life because you're too proud to admit you were wrong about the virtues of a bachelor and so uh, that great moment when he says you know I, I had a different taste in food when I was younger so okay Let's go with this. And again, that moment when he goes with the flow, um, uh, Shakespeare is so aware of how noble human beings, when they're uncompromising, unyielding, stand by principle, find something to die for. But he also sees that that's plum crazy at times in life. Uh, and especially 
when you behave in love the way you might behave in politics. Uh, it's, it's one thing to have a integrity in a political career. It's another thing to have integrity when it's preventing you from you know, just getting married, as happens uh, with Benedict. Uh, uh, and I can't, this, this guy, Shakespeare, master of comedy, master of tragedy. No one else even comes close. Uh, 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 when Woody Allen tried to make a serious movie, it was a flop, and justifiably so. Uh, Ingmar Bergman made a good comedy a, uh, there, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, I, I think you can come close to understanding why Shakespeare was the master of comedy and tragedy. When you see that he understood these two sides of life, that the, uh, <laughs> there's a time to hold them and there's a time to fold them. There I have summed up Shakespearean comedy for you perfectly. Okay. A time for integrity and a time for flexibility. Well, uh, speaking of fold them, uh, we do have other questions, but yeah, it, it is time to, to fold them. Uh, this was excellent. Uh, there were inv the invitations for you to go to Vancouver Island. There's, uh, um, uh, there's other questions, but uh, I have uh, other questions, but th this was great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was this was a real treat, and this uh, uh, this is a, certainly a great addition to the to Woolen and Westlaco. Uh, thank you again, Professor Cantor, and thank you everyone else for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this will conclude our our lecture for for tonight. Um, uh, uh, everyone, uh, go forth and hey, nani nani. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh... And again, thank you for inviting me. It was a real pleasure and a chance to uh, speak these ideas and actually work up my interpretation of much of do about nothing. I know so much more about John of Austria than I did three days ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, you just it's just an incredible connection, right? And I, I haven't seen anyone really comment on it. Um, Asimov makes some comments, but I, I wasn't quite clear on how to uh, tie it together myself. But um, Anyway, uh, it was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, good night to, ever, to our audience. And uh, uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Cantor. You're welcome. Thanks. Good night.